My youngest daughter teaches dance to toddlers. So she's 17 and uh, works with toddlers. So you can just imagine how that goes sometimes. And so she comes home and tells us a thousand stories of how it goes teaching them how to, you know, tumble on their bellies and all these things. Uh, but my favorite is her new set of words that she's like, my friends, those are porcupine words. Let's use our teddy bear words. And she <laughs> tells them when they get using these unkind voices. And I think about when we're training people how to use kind voices um, as a former educator or even out in the world, we want to be kind to people. But sometimes we lose our strong opinions and we lose what we're really trying to get done in the world because we're afraid of being porcupines. We're afraid of having spiky opinions. And I know that I have that fear sometimes, even though I have some soapboxes that I could get up on real fast, but I get afraid of what's going to happen if I share this point of view. Will, will people not like me? Are people going to unfollow? Are they going to, am I going to have trolls in my comments? Like what's going to happen? That's the fear that comes up for me when I think about having those spicy, spiky, porcupine um, <laughs> opinions. But I have an amazing coach and she is always pushing me to have stronger point of view. And so when I was thinking about how do I help leaders really lead people places, I could think of no one better than Kate Harris to have on the show. Kate is a business coach. She is an amazing copywriter, a fantastic mom, and all around just really enjoyable human to have on. So I am so excited for you to meet Kate. Welcome. So yes. glad that you're here. I'm so excited to be here. I'm laughing inside because I'm hearing you talking about porcupine words and teddy bear words. And I'm like, I really like my porcupine words. I know. I know. <laughs> That's right. It's like, I like some of that sometimes and we need it. Sometimes you have to, you know, pop the bubble of ridiculousness and that takes that takes something that's sharp. And oh, yeah. um, that's not always a bad thing, even though as I think both of us have experienced in our lifetimes, a little bit of like, you woman, stop being so sharp. Uh, you know, <laughs> just thinking that I was like, but also for the women in the room who have uh, heard it since you were babies. And, uh, yeah, yeah. We're break that down. <laughs> we have to, break, have to unlearn a little bit of that uh, and go back to the way that we were. And I'm, I'm constantly learning that as well. Like that is just one of the things that I think is my growth as a leader, as a podcaster, as a thought leader. I even still struggle with saying those words, you know, but I think it's really important that we talk about why I don't really love the term executive presence. I think that is really alienating for a lot of things, but you having a point of view and how you express that point of view clearly and intentionally is incredibly powerful as a leader. So first, let's start with who you are. Like, tell us a little bit how you got here, how you got to being a strategist, a business coach, copywriter. Tell us the things. You got it. Uh, so my husband and I have been working together since before we got married, which was almost 20 years ago, which is crazy to me. <laughs> uh, but we were originally on stages all over the world doing magic shows. Yes, I used to get cut in half. That is a real part of my, you know, that like slip that on your resume. Used I know. To, I used yeah. to get cut in half. Yeah. yeah. You know, begs that question of, are you serious? Yes. <laughs> uh, so over the years, because we owned this business, uh, we just worked together. So I started writing a little bit. I was performing. And then t about 10 years into our marriage, I had kids. Mm -hmm. And so my role came off the stage and I was sitting behind a desk a lot more often because I was at home and he was out traveling. So we, I, you know, just writing, writing stuff, creating things on the, on the go. Uh, I've always been a writer so that that skill comes naturally to me. And I think I need to point out that I'm also an Enneagram eight. Mm -hmm. So having a lot of opinions also comes very naturally to me. <laughs> uh, that's just, that's just who I am uh -huh. so I to learn since I was really little, how to channel mm -hmm. all of those thoughts, all of those feelings, all those emotions in a really practical, tangible way, even if it was just for me. So I had that and then the business stuff. So in 2016, we uh, started running Story Conference. And when we took over Story, we wanted to make huge shifts. And that required a lot of new language uh, for a new audience. And I became the exclusive writer for all of that kind of Within six months, it was, hey, here's what we're doing. Okay, start doing it. <laughs> um, so I had a lot of experience 
writing for creatives, writing for leadership, writing for big companies like Amazon and Nike and Google and Disney um, and NASA. So stuff like that. <laughs> um, and then COVID, like everybody, we had to pivot. So we took all of the things we were doing live and put them online. And we, my husband and I started a business coaching program um, that became the Poetics, which is I love it. It is so much fun. But stepping into that role was really new for me. And finding that voice and going, oh, I can talk to other people about finding their voice. I can talk to other people and encourage them to step out of the shadows a little bit and step out of the wings and onto the stage uh, has been really, really cool. And I am, I have found like a really sweet, passionate spot. Mm -hmm. that. So, yeah. I love that story. I love that. What's well, a great little Reader's Digest version of a 20 years, you know, from traveling <laughs> and cut in half to you know, writing things for NASA. Isn't yeah. that the normal path? <laughs> yes. Yes. Totally. Maybe buying a chateau in France next. It's totally fine. Uh, I'm bored. I'm not allowed to be bored. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So, you know, we're talking about how to speak like a leader and I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the words point of view. I mean, it's all over TikTok. You go like POV, blah, 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 you know, or the, a reel or whatever. And it is, it is your literal perspective around something. But when we talk about point of view as a leader, how do you, how do you define that? What, give us a, some parameters around this idea of point of view. Yeah. So a couple of things. One, I talk about this a lot and that is you have a point of view, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Everything about who you are and what you've experienced over your life has shaped how you see the world around you. You, you can't get away from it. You can't deny it. So thinking that point of view is something that you are going to craft and then express to people, though that's not necessarily wrong, it's not really true either. Mm. Because even that point, point of view is being informed by your own point of view. So there's that. And I think the reason why things like TikTok or Instagram, like why it's become buzzy is because we didn't really express it, mm. especially especially in kind of this creative leadership space. It was just, this is just the way things are. Yeah. We don't rock the boat. We just do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Clock in, clock out, clock in, clock out. Don't think, just do. Mm -hmm. And this kind of a renaissance in the work space has happened, not just since COVID, since well before that. I think people were yeah. going, but I have stuff that I feel, or I this doesn't align with how I see the world around me or what I want my customers to experience or what I want my team to feel. And point of view is not a soft skill. <laughs> just to be super clear, it's let's just not. Let's just say that again. <laughs> point of view is not a soft skill. Yeah. <laughs> Having an opinion is not a soft skill. Uh, speaking it is also not a soft skill. And being a leader who leads from a very strong point of view is crucial in creating something that is both sustainable and that people want to stay a part of, not just be a part of, but stay a part of. Yeah. Because the last thing leaders want are people in their atmosphere that don't, that have a misalignment. Mm -hmm. So be clear on the front side. Yeah. Instead of waiting halfway through someone's tenure in your, in your job or in their job and mm -hmm. go, oh, wait, I don't actually subscribe to any of this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it's one of the reasons why when I'm working individually with leaders or starting a program with an organization, we have to define what the values are. So you can even be clear about how do I align? Because yes. I don't know what I need to align to if I can't decide what I align with me first. Correct. And then I can do that forward. And it, the flip side of that is as somebody who has fallen, fallen, followed, who has followed, that's the word, I have followed a leader it, it, that the point of view was whatever the biggest donor had, and it would change. And it was so frustrating because we were like, I thought we decided this is the direction we we're going and we made this decision. And then all of a sudden, it's not that it, it's not only time wasting, wasting resources. It's also incredibly demoralizing. Well, I guess I just don't need to innovate or get creative. So you won't get work, good work out of your people because they're confused about where we're even going. 
Correct. Yeah, I my skin literally crawled while you said that because I was like, oh, <laughs> gross. Yeah. People want to follow strong leadership mm-hmm. because they want to be clear on where they're going. Yeah. That's if that is not clear, you're you're not that's not good leadership. I mean, let's just be blunt about it. It's just not good leadership. Mm-hmm. People should know and subscribe to what the value is of what you're trying to create, what you're trying to put out into the world, because you're going to get the best work out of them. Yes. And good leadership that has a strong point of view actually holds space for people. Uh, it holds space for yes. what they think and how they believe, because if they are coming in going, yes, I believe this. Mm-hmm. Yes, I want to be a part of this. It means that they also have that passion inside of them. They want to help make this better. They want to speak into it. So holding space in that as a leader is so important. Yeah. I think one of the things that gets confused is this idea of having a strong point of view and being a command and control leader. Like I think we conflate those two things. And I, I mean, I have worked under a command and control leader and it it doesn't, we just don't function well that way anymore. There are a few organizations that require that type of leadership style, but they are few and far between. And most places command and control will not get you the type of leaders, the type of team members, innovation, creativity, and treating your clients and customers the way you want versus having a really strong point of view is inviting. And it allows that space that you're talking about. And I think one of the things that we have been talking about, you, me, Harris, and some others, is this idea of we're in this cultural crisis in organizations because it's a leadership crisis. And so much of it is because we're afraid to pop the bubble. We're afraid to use that porcupine porcupine point of view because we don't know what's going to happen. So how do you help people kind of get over that fear of, oh, okay, I've discovered my point of view, but what will people say? You know, like how do you help people not craft, but move <laughs> past that? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because it's actually really hard for me because Getting my own point of view out there is not difficult for me. Having a strong (laughs) perspective and just saying it is not difficult for me. So having to coach people on how to do that requires a lot of grace. But one of the ways that inside the poetics that we kind of address this is we have people write a manifesto. So if you were going to say anything to your people, what would you say? It's a rally cry. It is a here's. It's, it's your I have a dream speech. It's, it's really yeah. the best way to describe it. Martin Luther King did not lead with dictatorship. Mm-hmm. It wasn't this, hey, this is wrong. We need to make it stop. Yes, and. Mm-hmm. It was, but what about the vision? How yeah. many people can I invite into this space to go, hey, I'm going over there. Do you want to come with me? Mm-hmm. Instead of, hey, we're going there. So yeah. get, in, get in the boat. Let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, and the way that he crafted, I have a dream was just this vision of what was possible. I have a dream that this could be possible. I have a dream that this could be possible. If you were as a leader to, to craft that same point of view and go, I want to, I, I, I just want to take you over here. What if this was possible? What if this was possible? What if this could stop? Mm-hmm. Would you want to, would you want to join me on that journey? And so we encourage people to write manifestos because they're really powerful uh, ways to just get everything out of your own head, which is half the issue. Because yep. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. When oh. you wrote your manifesto, it was the once you got it out of your head and onto a physical computer or piece of paper, everything got so much easy from easier from there. Oh, absolutely. Because I, and that's the thing, and Francis Bacon quote is that writing makes a man exact. When we get it out in writing, we get it. We're like, oh, the clarity happens. Sometimes clarity comes through doing, and then you have to write, and then you have to do some more. But the manifesto part of that, you know, I I think about, you know, people who are watching Ginger, Allison, Kelly, you know, uh, like when you are sitting at your own desk, you have to decide, what am I doing here? And then when you can get that out, then you can move forward with so much more 
literal confidence because I am clear, I'm coming from a place of clarity, changes the way you show up, even yes. when you are working in a large corporation or even when you are working for yourself. Both of those places require that level of clarity. So when after I wrote my manifesto and I realized, oh yeah, there are a couple components to this that I don't talk about enough because I believe work should be a joy. And a lot of that informed the introduction to the Joyosity podcast. It's not the exact same words, but it became so much easier. Like, what are we doing here? What are yes. we doing with Joyosity? Yes. We're equipping people. We're going to try things out. We're going to celebrate failure. We're going to say work should be a joy. And how do we get there? And it, we don't have to sacrifice profits for that. We just have to treat people like people. Like all of that rolls off my tongue because we spent time really crafting a manifesto. Yeah. And one of the things I think that was so freeing about that is you don't have to necessarily put it out into the world as its own document. It's self-informative, which I think is why it is so powerful. Yeah, it's the getting out, mm -hmm. getting it out of your head, because when you verbalize things, it just changes everything. Mm -hmm. It's oh, I, even if I'm the only person who ever reads this. I'm myself am reading it from a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, we were talking before we even got on this, on this uh, live about just the power of our brains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the power of our brain to just step outside of itself and look at something more strategically and go, oh gosh, I feel this. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible feeling to go, oh wow, I didn't, re I didn't even realize I felt this. Yeah. I didn't even realize that these were the things I needed to say. Um, and my friend, our friend, Ken Black, mm -hmm. uh, it's always stuck with me years ago. He said, uh, a manifesto, oh crap. Now I'm going to forget, <laughs> but it was something about a manifesto. Anything short of a manifesto is simply an advertisement. Mm, that's so and good. it was so brilliant because he was like, this should in like, push us into action. Mm -hmm. It should, it should make us stand up and go, yes, if it doesn't, it is simply something that we can just keep scrolling. Yeah. So yeah. it shouldn't stop the scroll. Yeah. One of the things that I think is so powerful about doing that work for yourself. And I think, you know, cause sometimes the objections come, I'm like, I'm not leading, I'm only leading one other person, or I'm just the project manager that's coordinating, you know, all of these other people, or even the people that do lead a team, I've got to do what my leadership says. And I have worked with several leadership clients that are coaching clients where they decided, here's how my team is going to run. Here's how we're going to do it here. And here's how we're going to take care of each other. Here's how, and here's why. And what has happened are as they have moved around, those people followed them. They left that agency. They went to another place. And people like, I'm going to follow you outside of whatever the corporation was, because that leader took care of their people and they had a strong point of view about why. And that is the power of knowing for yourself what your own point of view is. Yes. Yeah, because you want to follow those kind of leaders. You mm -hmm. want to go where they go because you know where they're headed. Brene Brown mm -hmm. says to be clear is to be kind. Absolutely. And yeah. So if we are as leaders speaking clearly, we are doing a service to the people who are underneath us, the people that we are leading. Yeah. And that is intoxicating to people mm -hmm. because they go, oh my gosh, for once in my life, not only am I so clear on the vision, but I feel seen in it. Yeah. And I would move heaven and earth to make sure I can stay a part of that. Yeah. And my like Enneagram seven self. So if you're new to the Enneagram, this is like the first time you've ever listened to me. The Enneagram is a personality framework and uh, they are labeled by numbers. And so Kate is an eight, which is a really strong, I call them the protective challengers. They're going to challenge the status quo. I'm an Enneagram seven. I want to bring all the things. I don't want to be limited in anything. And so one of the actual biggest growth growth aspects of writing a manifesto for me as a leader was releasing the idea that I could please everybody because I'm not a people pleaser, but I want to keep my options open. And so that keeping my options open was really causing me to slow down when I didn't need to leave that option open because if they would come, I wasn't going to work with them anyway. Like, yeah. why did I want that? It's illogical, but once you get there, it's so, so powerful to say, it's okay that you're not with me. You know, Go, go with God. So fine that we're not doing this part together. Doesn't mean you're wrong and I'm right or I'm wrong and you're right. It just means we're not going to do that part together. And that is freeing. Scary, but it is freeing. It's quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. If you could have quality employees, quality leaders, quality clients mm -hmm. versus, oh, look at how many friends I have over on the Facebook. <laughs> it means nothing. Like when you put it in that context, like, yeah. oh, I have 10,000 friends on Instagram. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> I have like 70 real people that actually follow me like stuff, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't even matter because those that smaller number are actually the people that subscribe to the vision, mm -hmm. and get it and want to be a part of it. And absolutely. they will stay with it versus the other ones that will come and go. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I just looked at the time and um, <laughs> we're going to talk to you forever about this. I'm so glad everyone's here for our 75 minute conversation. <laughs> I know. I just like need to start doing a part two, like for everybody. We have to figure out how to make that happen. I am so grateful for you being on the show today. Yes. Um, tell the people, where, which hand right here, whoop, where they can find you. This is going to get you to your LinkedIn, but tell them, you know, what they can do, how to follow you. Uh, yeah, so I would little challenge. Yeah, so thing. you can follow me. LinkedIn is a really great place to follow me. Uh, we started off this year as a team. Um, challenging our Poetics members to really up their LinkedIn game. And I have stayed on that as well. It's a great place to check out my point of view and the things that I am thinking and wondering and pondering on and challenging other people too. Um, I know one of the things we talked about, Jen, was uh, encouraging them to do an action. Oh, yeah. And what I would love to see is if y'all would create your own manifesto and tag Jen and I in it, mm -hmm. um, post it to LinkedIn or DM it to us. It doesn't matter if you're really not comfortable putting it into the, the atmosphere. <laughs> it's fine. But challenge yourself to write it. What do you believe? Where are you? If you were to say, I'm going over here, do you want to come with me? What would you invite people into? Mm -hmm. It is such an incredibly powerful exercise. Tag Jen and I in it. Would love to see that. You can also connect with me on Instagram. Um, you'll see a lot of pictures of my kids. <laughs> uh, there's three of them and they are hooligans. They so, are amazing. Follow me there at Kate M. Harris, uh, at Kate M. Harris. I was going to yeah. say .com, but that is not That's correct. That's not it. Uh, I do. We have a few Milo fans in our house when she shows up on the Instagram. There's a lot of Milo fans. There's a, yeah, there's a few in my house that get very excited. And always Bella. We have a dog lover in our house. Yes. Uh, so they want to see that too. Uh, I'm so grateful for you and just leading us in this process. And I think as I am continuing to grow in this as a leader as well, I'm always really aware of as I'm leading other people, I, I, you know, as a leadership consultant that I need to demonstrate y'all I'm learning stuff too. Like if any leader is like, I got it all together and then you want to follow, that is not your person. So um, I appreciate that you helped me in this area. And um, I'm so glad that you spent the time with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Great. Yay. So next week we have, we're here live every week at 1 PM Eastern on Joyosity live here on LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, and you can catch the podcast later next week. We have Jeff Kozatek. Ironically, another former uh, magician who is uh, really? a friend of mine and a really amazing leader and performance coach. And he will be with us next week. So join us live next week at 1 p.m. Eastern. Kate, thanks again for being here. Pleasure. Bye, everybody. So let me put my coach hat on for just a sec. Don't just leave this here. Take a moment. What did you learn? What's your next tiny action step? Share this episode with someone and tell them. Connect with us to keep this conversation going. As always, I'm Jen Whitmer. Thank you for listening to Joyosity. I don't take for granted that your earballs have a lot of information coming at you. Please take a moment to rate and subscribe. It really helps more people join us in creating positive culture with complex people. So work is a joy, people are whole, and organizations flourish. Can't wait for you to join us next week.